These icons were considered windows into eternity. And so they would gaze at the icon, at that image, and then they would move forward and they would kiss it. And then they would slowly back away and move on to the next icon. And it gave them something. Look into them deeply. You will see the reality that they are drawing from. These are just pictures on a board. That's what a, an archetypal image is. It's connected to deeper sources of meaning and energy. And if you dwell on it, it gives you something. Is yep. the symbol uh, an image of the archetype? Mm -hmm. Is that what a symbol is communicating? Is, yeah. is well, an archetype? It, partially, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, it's drawing on the archetype uh, that's invisible. Jung says the symbol is a magnet. Mm -hmm. It has a magnetic quality to it. So yeah, if you hold the symbol and uh, live with the symbol, it draws on deeper energies in the psyche beyond mm -hmm. your experience. It, it brings something to you. You know, when I was in Russia years ago, I did quite a lot of work in Russia. We were working on bringing Jungian psychology after the Cold War to Russia. I was in a church. Um, they reopened the churches shortly after it was possible. It was amazing to see how religion came back so quickly. People had been religious, but it was um, uh, you know, very dangerous. But now they could do it in the open. So I w went into this church one afternoon, and I watched the, um, the people coming in. There were mostly elderly women coming in, and they would kneel in front of the icons, you know, the, the picture of the virgin and the uh, child. And if you look at that picture as a sign, it's not very good art, you know. Um, you find these uh, pictures in, uh, you know, uh, used art shops and so on. But in the church and in that setting, it had a very special power. And so they would gaze at the icon, uh, at that image. And then they would move forward and they would kiss it. And then they would slowly back away and move on to the next icon. And it gave them something. These icons were considered windows into eternity. You know, you, if you look into them deeply, you will see the reality that they are drawing from. These are just pictures on a board, but they're connected to, that's what a, an archetypal image is. It's connected to deeper sources of meaning and energy. And if you dwell on it, it gives you something. It gives you meaning. It gives you a sense of wholeness. It gives you a sense of um, fate and destiny uh, or belonging. You belong, you're a child of God. Mm -hmm. You are in the lap of the Virgin. She is consoling you for your suffering and so on. So it's very vivid and very powerful. And, you know, Jung spoke about the religions as uh, therapeutic <laughs> institutions. They, they preserve the link between the conscious ego and the collective unconscious and the symbols of the collective unconscious, the archetypal images. They gave people access. And what we suffer from, Modern Man in Search of His Soul, the Jung's book in the 1950s, is uh, a desacralization of the world as a result yeah. of the Enlightenment. We got a lot of benefits from the Enlightenment, a lot of technology and understanding of the material world, but we lost this connection to the symbolic world. And that's why Jung thought. Um, Depth psychology was so important. It is picking up where the religions drop the ball or where people can no longer find uh, their meaning in them or a source of um, connection to the spiritual world. Yeah. In a way, religion is making a comeback. Religions will never die out. They're dangerous in one way, you know, they lead people. They become ideological and political, and they lose their spiritual values. But uh, they, uh, 
for many people, they, they remain uh, a resource, and I, and I fully respect that. Jung said uh, when a uh, lapsed Catholic came to him for analysis, he said he made her into a better Catholic than she ever was before. <laughs> and the Pope, and he said the Pope sent me a thank you note because she was a, a Roman noblewoman and went back and told the Pope what Jung had done for her. Uh, so he didn't try to remove people from their religious roots at all, strengthen them, anything, because they are a resource, symbol, sim, symbolically speaking. Yeah, and I like that we can reach out to them um, in manners akin to you having a stone on your desk as a reminder of that we can have objects. We can yes. we we can paint a picture, not in order to become a great artist, but in order to connect our hands and our minds, our bodies with an image and sink into it. Yes. And and that then perhaps like uh the man who was not religious and saw the image of Christ on Easter morning. Uh, we're opening a portal for something to come through to us. That's right. That, uh, that we don't create it, but we can reach out toward it mm -hmm. in in all manner of relatively everyday ways. Absolutely, I think uh, linking the material world to the mm -hmm. um, symbolic world is very important. the The problem uh, can arise that it just turns into a sign. When symbols turn into signs, they lose their power. They, they still mean something. You know, you see a cross on a church, it means there's a church there. In Switzerland, it's a Catholic church if there's a cross on it. If there's a rooster on it, it's a Protestant church. Um, Murray, can you talk a little bit about the difference between a symbol and a sign for our listeners who may not? Yeah. Know the difference? A sign tells you something uh, you know, that is familiar. Like I it's said, it's already known. Sign. It's it's known. Mm -hmm. uh, Starbucks uh, on the on the window means there's coffee inside. You know that. Um, if you see uh, a, a church building, you know that it's a church. Um, I, I was in a. I went into a church uh, some years ago in, uh, where was that? Portugal, I think it was, yeah, somewhere in Portugal. And um, it was full of worshipers, you know. In Switzerland, the churches are empty mostly, but in Portugal, uh, I think they still have quite a strong uh, presence. Um, and they were truly worshiping. The priest was in, and so, to me, it was, there's a church, I think I'll step in, uh, it's a sign. I couldn't participate in the worship because I'm not a Catholic, it, it doesn't speak to me, I don't have that, it doesn't, it doesn't resonate. But I could watch them, and I could see they were into it. They, they were experiencing something. So while the church for me is a sign for them, it's a symbol. They're going into a sacred space. That's a symbolic space. There's there's a mystery there, and those, uh, um, you know, the, the those sensors that are swinging around, smoke coming out of them, are curiosities for me. Oh, look at that uh, uh, man is you know blowing smoke. What what's that all about? Uh, but if you're into the ritual and you participate in it, it has a very powerful effect. You know, it's it's scaring away the bad spirits. It's uh, cleansing. It's creating a sacred space. Uh, so this, it's a very important difference between sign and symbol. You, do, you just look at signs. It's in your head. You understand it. But symbols are, are deep experiences. And I think this is relevant in lots of contexts, but maybe particularly when we work with dreams, because I think if we're not familiar with dream work, we tend to we tend to think of some of the images in our dreams as signs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, this yep. means this. That's you know, right. I dreamt about a tiger, so that means that uh, something's going to attack me this week or something like that. <laughs> or I, uh, my inner tiger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, you know, uh, uh, 
James Hall, who is, you might know, have heard of him too. He was a founder of the Interregional Society and was a man I knew well. He talked about archetypal reductionism. Huh, that's great. You know, yeah. That's when you, you just give a name to something in a dream. You say, oh, that's your instincts. Oh, that's an animal. That's your instincts. Or that's a bird. That's, your, uh, that's something to do with the spirit or animus or something. Just naming things. Uh, you're treating them as signs. It, it can be helpful. A theory can be helpful. It gives you a kind of orientation. Right. But um, a, a good dream, we, we don't really um, interpret dreams the way Freud did. Okay, Freud gives you the reduced meaning of the dream. It means you want to sleep with your mother. Okay, period, <laughs> end of the story. <laughs> That's it. Um, uh, Jung would take the mother as the great mother in the lap of the mother. It's not regressive necessarily. Have the experience. Um, and uh, when I work with dreams uh, in analysis with, with my clients, um, I try to re-experience the dream with them. They tell, me the, they tell me the dream that they've had. Sometimes they have written it down. And then I ask them about details, and we sort of go into a reverie state of yeah. living uh, in the dream together, mm -hmm. and then exploring it and seeing where it might lead. You know, amplifications that uh, Jung suggests if you have some references in your mind. So somebody told me about a dream about an owl the other day, and immediately I thought of Athena. That's yeah, right. Sure. Uh, uh, wisdom and all that but that that isn't enough but it can give you some direction where to go and experience the wisdom of seeing in the dark that mm -hmm. they all seems to have and you know it's a kind of a spiritual guide <laughs> 